two people face off against Zuko in the second to last episode of Avatar The Last Airbender. One is a conniving strategist and prodigy. She did what those before her could not and captured Ba Sing Se in the name of the Fire Nation. She's as psychotic as she is relentless. When she decides something, or someone, is in her way, she bears down upon them with a ruthless intensity. The other person is quite different. She is a lonely teenager from a broken family. Her mother left, and her father is an abusive tyrant. She badly needs help, but she's not going to get it. Though she's frightened and anxious and paranoid, she would never admit any of that. These two people breathe at the same time. They laugh and smile and cry at the same time. They share the same mind, the same heart, and the same spirit. How is that possible? Because they are the same person. Azula. This is Avatar Explained, Azula Edition. When we first meet the Fire Nation Princess, it is in a flashback. Episode 112, The Storm, depicts a cruel-looking child smirking as Ozai, their father, burns Zuko's face. The show draws attention to the smirk, foreshadowing the important role Azula will play. Who is this person? How can she be so cold-hearted that she smiles at a 13-year-old's face being burned? How will she fit into the grand narrative? Azula appears in several of Zuko's flashbacks to his past, and consistently she plays an antagonistic role. She was born a manipulator. Her mother wonders what is wrong with her. She throws hunks of bread at turtle ducks. She's constantly strategizing and mocking. Zuko in these flashbacks is naive, but kind-hearted. Both physically and emotionally, he is far less hurt than we see him at the start of the series. But Azula is exactly the same as we see her in the present timeline of Avatar. If these hateful tendencies are unsettling to see in a young teenager, they are downright disturbing to see in a small child. In a sing-song voice, young Azula informs Zuko that their father, Ozai, is going to try to kill him. Earlier, she gets excited, genuinely excited, about the possibility of Uncle Iroh dying in Ba Sing Se because that would make her father, Ozai, next in line for the throne. She insults Iroh for returning from Ba Sing Se after the death of his son. Every sign points to her being a person without the capacity for sympathy or compassion. Even Iroh, the kindest and most loving person in this show, says that Azula is crazy, and thus she needs to go down. Why then do I care about her? Why shouldn't I write her off as nothing but a bad seed? Why shouldn't I cheer when she's defeated at the end of the series? Why is it that when she's defeated, I'm overwhelmed by a great rush of loss and pity and sorrow? I suppose I feel for her because the show does. Avatar The Last Airbender is one of the most extraordinarily empathetic shows ever made. Aside from minor characters and the show's ultimate big bad, Ozai, every character is emotionally analyzed. The show understands what they want and why they want it. Great attention is paid to how they react to the circumstances they face, and when they fail, there is real sorrow and pity. Even Zhao, the sneering season 1 villain voiced by Jason Isaacs, is something of a tragic figure. He's consumed by his pride and arrogance, which grow larger as he rises up the ranks. He becomes so committed to winning the Siege of the North, and not going down in Fire Nation history books as a failure, that he kills the Moon Spirit, causing the moon to disappear from the sky, which endangers the entire world. At the end of the season, he is taken into the spirit world. Zuko tries to save him, but he's too proud to accept Zuko's help. As Azula is far more important of a character than Zhao, and as she receives far more screen time than him, perhaps I shouldn't be surprised that the show manages to evoke empathy for her. 
but I am. Typically, characters like her are treated as nothing but monsters. That they can't quite feel things in the way that most people do is given as a reason to not care about them. But in the case of Azula, it's given as a reason to care about her. Yes, she's as pure a villain as any character not named Ozai, but that something is deeply wrong with her, and has been for a long time, doesn't mean she's not worth trying to save. Aside from Katara's look of pain and pity as Azula goes crazy, no character in Team Avatar really cares about her, with one exception, that being Zuko. If there's one character who has reason to hate her, it's her brother. Throughout their shared childhood, no person consistently caused him more distress. She might not despise Zuko as much as Ozai does, and unlike Ozai, she at least seems to have a level of respect for him. But whenever he was miserable, she was always there, making it worse. As a little kid, she got joy out of tormenting him. Not in the siblings tease each other kind of way, but in the I want to see you suffer kind of way. And that hasn't changed much by the time she chases him down in season 2. But Zuko doesn't hate her. Crazy or not, she's still his sister. He wishes the relationship between them was normal, a wish that is likely amplified by the fact that they grew up in a broken household without a mother and with an abusive father. However, though she is like she is, he still wants them to be closer. We get a few hints of this in the series proper, like how he almost seems saddened when he thinks that she is going to die, but their relationship is explored much further in the Avatar comic trilogies The Search and Smoke and Shadow. It's important to note that he has no illusions about who she really is. He doesn't think she's actually a good person, or anything simple and misguided like that. He is more than willing to defeat her and take his rightful place on the Fire Nation throne. Before the final Agni Kai, she semi-mockingly says that she's sorry it has to end this way. Zuko simply responds that no, she's not. However, Zuko wishes she were better. He envies the bond Sokka and Katara have. They're always there for each other, even when they get on each other's nerves. He's a little shocked. The only sibling relationships he has known have been those of manipulation and utter betrayal. There's his own relationship with Azula, and there's Ozai's relationship with his brother Iroh, which was so lacking in warmth and tenderness that Ozai's response to Iroh's son dying was to ask their father, Azulon, to revoke Iroh's right to become Fire Lord. Zuko's perspective toward his sister is the perspective of the show as a whole. They're both clear-eyed about Azula, but they both pity her. Unlike a certain section of the Avatar fandom that's determined to see Azula as a pure victim, they know that she was not abused by her mother. They know her mother loves her and is saddened by what she has become. But they also know it's a shame Azula doesn't see herself as worthy of being loved. Actually loved. This is why Azula is the most tragic character in Avatar The Last Airbender, a show full of tragic characters. She feels not only that she must rule by fear, but that she must maintain her relationships by fear. Notice that I specifically said she must rule by fear, not one must rule by fear. This is not a philosophical stance, it's a deeply, deeply personal one. Azula isn't like other people, and although she pretends to be proud of that, it actually makes her very insecure. Think of what Iroh said to Zuko in episode 209, Bitter Work, that pride is not the opposite of shame, but its source. She is possessed by bitterness and brutal self-loathing. She doesn't believe that anyone could love or even like her for her. Because of that belief, she uses fear to control people. Even her two closest friendships with Mei and Tai Li are maintained by fear. The only way she even convinces Tai Li to join her is by threatening Tai Li's life while she's performing at a circus. What makes this deeply sad is that it's unnecessary. Azula's mother loves her, and although I'm not sure Zuko would use the word love, he feels exactly the same way. But even setting aside her family, she doesn't have to use fear. In episode 305, The Beach, 
which serves as more or less the Rosetta Stone in terms of understanding Azula. We get to spend time with her when she's not trying to conquer the world. And yes, I do mean get to, not have to. Azula is incredibly entertaining and adorkable. Most of this is unintentional, but it still proves a point. Yes, she does crush a child's sandcastle just to prove her superiority, and she unveils that great you'll never rise from the ashes of your shame and humiliation line after beating a rival team in beach volleyball, but let's not forget that she, this prodigy who conquered Ba Sing Se, is open to playing beach volleyball in the first place. And let's not forget about how she goes along with Ty Lee's plan in order to get herself a boyfriend, even though she later frightens him with her explosive rhetoric. And most importantly, let's not forget about the moment when she convinces Zuko to come down to the beach with her for their seaside bonding session. She's antisocial and awkward, but she's not entirely unlikable. While she is not necessarily the kind of friend that everyone would want to have, it's not hard to imagine someone forming a close and personal relationship with her if only she would let them. She could be the kind of person who may be a little strange and who may say the wrong things at the wrong time, but who also has unexpected ideas and is fiercely, fiercely loyal. Her problem is that she pushes people away because in her mind, she equates opening up to people with weakness. She equates letting herself be loved with being a total failure. Even if being cruel and callous comes naturally to her, that doesn't mean her environment has nothing to do with the kind of person she is by the time Ozai charges her at the end of book one with the task of tracking down Zuko. Her father, and to a lesser extent her grandfather, enabled all her worst impulses instead of planting the seeds for her to become a more caring person. Yes, she was perhaps doomed to have a difficult time connecting with people. Yes, she was perhaps doomed to be somewhat cold. Yes, there are people who never would have opened up to her because they're intimidated by aspects of her personality that are unchangeable. But that doesn't mean she was doomed to be permanently evil, and it definitively does not mean she was doomed to the tragic, heart-rending ending she eventually receives. She could have avoided this, but she didn't, because throughout the series, she can't understand why anyone would want to be around her. She thinks that no one would be around her unless they had to be. Maybe if she had been raised far from Ozai, and learn to better process her anxiety and insecurity, she wouldn't be the person we see over the course of Avatar The Last Airbender. Even by the midpoint of Season 3, Azula's downfall is not imminent. In fact, the Day of Black Sun Invasion turns into another triumph for her. Because she disguised herself as a Kyoshi warrior near the end of Season 2, she heard of the plan to invade the Fire Nation on the Day of the Eclipse, and she counters it decisively. The capital city of the Fire Nation is completely empty when the invasion happens, and when Team Avatar confronts Azula on their way to Ozai, she toys with them and wastes their time until the eclipse has ended and the Firebenders have their powers back. But, continuing the contrast between Zuko and Azula, as Zuko moves further down the road to redemption, Azula completely deteriorates. The catalyst for this is when her friends leave her, in Greek and Shakespearean tragedies, it's impossible to disconnect a character's fatal flaw from every element of their downfall. It's not just that the character's downfall is caused by that flaw, it's that the downfall would have absolutely not occurred without the flaw, and this is the case here. Azula doesn't understand her relationships with her friends. She believes she knows everything there is to know about people, but this is not the case and she is too prideful to learn the truth. There is no doubt that her friends do fear her, but that's not the only reason they stick with her. There are millions of people who fear Azula in this world, but she definitely does not have millions of friends. Her relationships with Mei and Tai Lee aren't as close friendships as she could have had if she had been able to free herself from the idea that she couldn't be loved, but they are still, at least to an extent, real friendships. They are not bonds solely based on fear. 
Tai Li admires Azula. This is questionable morally, but it does show that even as callous and self-loathing as Azula is, there are still people who care about her for her. Not because they're afraid of her or because she's the crown princess of the Fire Nation, but she can't see that. Because she believes no one will love her, she's convinced herself that fear is a much more powerful force than love, but she's proven wrong about that. When Mei has to choose between Azula and the man she loves, Zuko, she chooses Zuko, even though he left her. When Tai Li has to choose between helping Mei and allowing Mei to be hurt by Azula, she chooses Mei, even though this means being captured. If Azula had tried to appeal to the friendship between them by saying something like, Remember all the time we've spent together. Remember all the memories we've shared. She might have been able to convince them. Instead, she tries desperately to make them fear her more, and the result is them turning against her. This sends her into a tailspin. From a narrative standpoint, she could have saved those friendships, but from a thematic perspective, it was practically impossible. It would have required her to rise above her fatal flaw, and she can't do that. Her learning that trying to control people with fear does not always work, sadly does not teach her to depend on love, or compassion, or honesty. Instead, it teaches her that she cannot depend on anyone, ever. She has no one, and she hates herself, and this sends her into complete madness. When she confronts Zuko in the Southern Raiders, she says that she's about to celebrate becoming an only child. This isn't the cunning genius who outsmarted the Earth Kingdom and Team Avatar at the end of Season 2, then toyed with Team Avatar during the Day of Black Sun. This is someone whose psyche has completely shattered, and she only gets worse when she's about to be crowned Fire Lord. Sensing disloyalty all around her, she sends away her servants, her advisors, and her Dai Li agents. She is alone as she faces Zuko. This is contrasted with Zuko, who has someone with him, Katara. The same Katara who despised him after he betrayed her in episode 220, The Crossroads of Destiny. Since that episode, Zuko has pulled himself from the brink of being lost forever, and completed an extraordinary redemption arc. Also since that episode, Azula has gone from the height of her triumph to being nothing but paranoid, mad, and neurotic. She, who has had everyone on her side, is defeated alone, while Zuko, who has spent the most time alone out of all the major characters in this show, defeats her while fighting alongside the person who once hated him more than perhaps anyone else in the world. Zuko has every right to gloat, but he doesn't. He feels terribly, terribly sorry for his sister. He mourns her losing the last fragments of her sanity, but he also mourns the relationship he could have had with her if she had been able to unlock the best version of herself instead of depending increasingly on her worst and most destructive impulses. He sees the two Azulas. Yes, he sees the cruel manipulator who's caused him pain and suffering all throughout his life, but he also sees a scared, lonely, 14-year-old girl whom he badly wishes he had been able to help. Aside from Ozai, who's introduced as a tyrant, and is still a tyrant at the end of the series, none of the characters in Avatar The Last Airbender are who they appear to be at first. That's the great thing about this show. It appends expectations in a real and satisfying and earned way. Aang is introduced as a silly little kid, but in reality he's much more complicated and vulnerable than that. Zuko is introduced as a simple villain, but it soon becomes clear that his desperation and bitterness have been caused by the emotional and physical abuse his father has inflicted upon him. Iroh is introduced as simple comic relief before being gradually revealed to be the wisest character in the show, and so on and so forth. For Zula, it's that she's introduced as being a perfect manipulator. Only later is it revealed how fragile her grasp on power and her own sanity really and truly is. Her fatal flaw causes her to lose everything. It's hard not to find that tragic. I certainly do, and so do Zuko and Katara. It's why Zuko doesn't abandon her. 
even after May and Ty Lee have. So thank you for watching. If you liked what you saw today, don't forget to like and comment and subscribe. Donate to my Patreon if you can and you want to see more content like this. Even a small donation is a huge help. Also, keep watching Avatar. It's a fantastic show, and every rewatch is more satisfying than the last. Tune in for the next Avatar Explained video. It will definitely be coming very soon. So thanks again. Adios, comrades.